Hello, I'm Rick Amasino from the University of Wisconsin. And I'm going to talk about how the exposure to the cold of winter promotes flowering in certain plant species, a process called vernalization. There are many plants that you're familiar with that require vernalization in order to flower. Some common garden vegetables, beets, carrots, cabbage. And you've probably never seen these plants flower because they're harvested before they have an opportunity to go through winter and trigger their flowering. And so what I'm going to talk about today is how vernalization, this process, triggers flowering. First, I want to define it. Vernalization is the acquisition of competence to flower that occurs after exposure to cold, but not necessarily flowering, just the ability to do so. Shown here is another example, an extreme example of a non-vernalized cabbage plant this particular plant is five years old, and it's not flowering because it's never been exposed to winter. It's been grown in a greenhouse. But I wanted to begin by discussing why plants might evolve this system of requiring cold to flower. In other words, what's the adaptive value? And here's one example of that adaptive value. That's to design a system so plants can flower rapidly in the spring. Shown here is a plant growing on the University of Wisconsin campus early in the spring. Its common name is Shepherd's Purse. But what I want you to notice is that the plant's flowering. It's made many seeds, and it has flower, flowers that are still opening. But pretty soon, this plant will have made all the seeds that it's going to make. It will shed those seeds, senesce, and die. And those seeds will lie dormant for most of the summer, and then germinate in the fall for another cycle of the plant, uh, plant growth. But what I also want you to notice is the scene around this plant. For example, it's flowering. It's almost done with its life cycle, yet the leaves aren't even out on the trees. And so this particular life history habit, that is, to require cold in many plants, is a system to let them begin to flower in the, begin to grow in the fall and flower in the spring. And I wanted to illustrate that with the next slide. Shown here is just a circular, uh, representation of a yearly cycle. And there are many plants that you're familiar with that their growing season is shown here in green. It's throughout the late spring through summer into fall. For example, a maple tree, a corn plant, and so on. But a theme of biology is organisms will evolve the ability to occupy niches where they're free from competition or reduced competition from other species. And that's, of course, true in the plant kingdom as well. So there are, are plants that have evolved the ability to occupy this niche, to begin flowering in the fall, and to complete the life cycle in the spring, like that shepherd purse plant that I just showed to you. A key part of this strategy, if plants are going to begin growing in the fall, is to make sure that flowering doesn't occur leading into winter, because that would be disastrous. That would uh, prevent the plant from reproducing. So these plants that have this life history shown in blue, typically start growing in the fall. And then after exposure to winter, are then capable of rapid flowering in the spring. There are other processes in plants as well as flowering for plants that grow in temperate climates, which experience seasonal change, that are also are controlled by exposure to cold. And a good example of that is bud dormancy. So for many plants in temperate climates, buds go dormant in the fall. And those buds can't resume growth in the spring unless, unless they've sensed a complete winter exposure to cold. In other words, short exposures of cold don't trigger flowering or the release of bud dormancy. Because in that case, fluctuating temperatures in the fall might trigger flowering just before winter. So many plant species, but not all, have evolved the ability to sense a long period of cold and only have a biological response, such as flowering, or the release of bud dormancy when a sufficient period of cold has been sensed. Another classic experiment that I want to mention uh, about the process of vernalization in some plants is that it creates a permanent memory in the plant. And here's a classic experiment that illustrates that. This was done in the 1940s by Lang and Melkers with Henbane. And shown here in this illustration on the top is a plant that's been exposed to cold, 
is able to flower if it's given the proper day length to flower. And in another talk in the iBio series, I talked about how day length influences flowering through the process called photoperiodism. So in this case, henbane needs both cold and then after cold, proper photoperiod in order to flower. If the plants are given cold and then given a photoperiod, in this case short days, that's not conducive to flower, they'll grow for well over a year without flowering, but they still have a memory of being in the cold because when they're shifted to long days, they're able to immediately initiate the process of flowering. So this simple and elegant experiment showed that in some plants, but this isn't true for all plants, there's a memory of this fertilized state. And what I'll tell you later on in the talk is that that memory of flowering results from altered states of chromatin, of a key repressor of flowering present in many plants. First, I want to give you a little bit of the background and how this system of vernalization was worked out in one particular plant, Arabidopsis thaliana, a model plant, at a molecular level. And so the story of the contribution of genetics to this goes back many decades where uh, natural variation in the response was studied. And these studies were first done by scientists uh, named Leibach and also Nap Zinn. And what they showed was that there's a lot of natural variation for flowering in Arabidopsis. And what I mean by that is you can find types of Arabidopsis that require cold to flower, but other types that don't. And if you cross those two types and ask how the genetic basis of that process segregates, for example, Nap Zinn found that there was, in the crosses he made, a single gene difference that was responsible for those, the difference between those that flowered in, in without cold or those that needed cold in order to flower rapidly. And this single gene that was responsible for this difference, he named Frigida because of the need for cold temperatures. Back in the time when uh, these scientists were doing the work, it wasn't possible to clone genes. And my group and, and other groups looked at natural variation more recently. In our experiments, as well as those of another colleague, Martin Corneef and his co-workers, we found yet another gene that varied naturally between those strains, some strains, that required cold for flowering and those that didn't. In fact, we used some different genotypes than the earlier workers had done, and this led to the discovery of two genes for natural variation, both Frigida and a gene we call flowering locus C, or FLC. And what we found was that plants that do not require vernalization do not have an active form of Frigida or flowering locus C. Those that require vernalization, exposure to cold for flowering, have active copies of both genes. So in other words, active copies of both genes set up a requirement for cold in order to flower. And shown here are Arabidopsis plants that uh, either don't have an active copy of Frigida or FLC. That's why the gene names are shown in lower case. That's convention for a mutant in these genes. Or a plant that has active copies shown in uppercase of both genes. Now, we were able, uh, using modern mapping techniques, to identify the FLC gene. And when we found it, one of the first things we did was put it back into plants um, that didn't have an active copy of the Frigida gene. And what we discovered, as illustrated here, is expressing the FLC gene alone, in other words, without its normal partner, Frigida, was able to block flowering in plants. So here's a plant that uh, is rapid flowering without cold. It's labeled COL for Columbia. That's the variety of Arabidopsis. But if we take that variety that doesn't require cold and put in the FLC gene in a way that it's expressed at high levels, its flowering is presented, prevented. Therefore, we know that FLC alone is sufficient to inhibit flowering. It turns out FLC is a gene that encodes a protein that's referred to as a Madsbox protein. And these often exist as tetramers, usually with partners, that repress or activate target genes. 
In this case, FLC may be partnering with another MADSBOX gene known as SVP. But clearly what's limiting for the process and what's different among some types of Arabidopsis is the level of FLC expression. Now what about its partner Frigida? I said in the normal situation, the wild type situation, that a vertilization requirement is established when both Frigida and FLC are present. Shown here are RNA levels of FLC either without Frigida or with Frigida. You can see that what Frigida is responsible for is in the wild type plant elevating the level of FLC such that flowering is prevented. And also the identification of the FLC gene led to an understanding of the process of vernalization. What was occurring at the molecular level is shown here. That when plants are exposed to a long period of cold, uh, FLC is silenced, its expression. Again, this is showing RNA levels. But on the other hand, exposure to a short period of cold, such as two days, really has no effect on FLC expression. And that fits with what we know about vernalization, that short periods of cold don't have much of an effect, if any, on flowering. The plant has evolved the ability to measure a long period of cold in order to flower in the spring. So what I want to do in the next uh, series of slides is show you an overview of what's happening to FLC expression during the life history of a plant like Arabidopsis. So in the fall, as I mentioned, in these types of plants where, uh, that require vernalization, and by the way, these types of plants are typically called biennials, which refers to the fact that they require two growing seasons in order to flower, two growing seasons separated by a winter. In that first growing season fall, flowering is repressed. And FLC is expressed, for example, in the upper parts of the shoot where it represses flowering. During exposure to cold, uh, through this process called vernalization, FLC is repressed so that in the spring, the silencing of FLC is what competence to flower in Arabidopsis and its relatives in the cabbage family, uh, that, that this competence to flower is FLC silencing, its lack of expression. But of course, this silencing, this competence to flower is transient. In the next generation, FLC needs to be reset so that the next generation, of course, has another requirement for cold in order to flower. In another talk in the iBio series, I mentioned how the photoperiod system works in plants. And that is that inductive photoperiods uh, lead to the production of a mobile signal of flowering called florigen, encoded by a gene called FT, which travels from leaves up into the meristem, where it partners with a product of another gene, FD, to initiate a cascade of gene expression that leads to the development of flowers. In this image, that, um, cask that, that series of events leading to the photoperiod activation of flowering is redrawn to what's occurring in the leaf, the activation by photoperiod through a gene called constans, a protein called constans, of florigen, which is FT, which travels to the meristem and partners with FD and initiates a cascade of gene expression that actually, shown here are some of the master regulators, but this cascade leads to changes in expression of thousands of genes that are necessary for flowers to form. One of those key genes is leafy, and shown here is an image from Detlef Weigel and Elliot Meyerowitz and their colleagues who were the first to identify the leafy gene. This is a longitudinal section through the growing tip, the meristem. And this shows that when the flowering signal arrives at the meristem, genes like leafy are expressed in those cells at the edges of the meristem, which will go on to differentiate into flowers. But back to the vernalization process and how flowering locus C inhibits all of this. Shown here is that pathway to flowering, which is illustrated in, in green. All of these are genes that promote flowering. And what FLC does, as I mentioned earlier, it's the type of protein that typically binds to genes. And it binds to several of these genes that promote flowering. 
it binds to their regulatory regions and inhibits their expression. So therefore, this is a very simple system overlaid on a photoperiod system that prevents the photoperiod system from activating flowering. And even in those plants that don't have a photoperiod system, they flower from other types of signals, they still have these types of genes, for example, that could be inhibited by a repressor to create a vernalization requirement for flowering. So in the fall season, when these types of plants start growing, FLC is preventing flowering by binding to the regulatory elements of key flowering genes. And what happens, as I mentioned, uh, after the process of vernalization occurs, throughout the winter, FLC is shut off, this inhibition is lifted, and then in the spring, flowering can occur because this promotive pathway to flowering can proceed now unimpeded by FLC. But that leads to another question. That is, how does vernalization lead to the silencing of FLC and thus the competence to flower? And for this, I want to introduce the concept of chromatin level regulation. As you probably know, in eukaryotic cells, chromatin is organized into higher order structures. So if we look at plain DNA, shown here in this nice illustration, that plain DNA is associated with proteins, and a typical unit, a fundamental unit of DNA structure in eukaryotes is DNA wrapped around various histone proteins to form a structure called the nucleosome. But as chromosomes condense, they can form even higher level structures. What I want to focus on is the nucleosome, which is shown here enlarged. And it shows the DNA wrapped around four different proteins, two copies of each, his various histone proteins. And the next slide shows an enlargement of that. Those histone proteins that form the core of the nucleosome are H3, H4, H2A, and H2B. And an important feature for chromatin level regulation of the histones is that there's a core region around which the DNA is wrapped. But there's also regions of the protein that extend out from the nucleosome. These are typically referred to as the tails of histone, just like the tail of a dog. There's something sticking out from the end. And so chromatin level regulation can occur when these tails of histones undergo certain types of covalent modifications. A quick overview of that is shown in this slide. That at various amino acids in these regions, protruding from the nucleosome, that there can be a wide range of covalent modifications to these amino acids. That includes phosphorylation, acetylation, methylation of arginine residues, methylation of lysine reg residues, ubiquitylation of certain residues. And this has led to a concept of the histone code, that modifications of the histones in nucleosomes, depending upon the, the type of modifications, can lead to either states of gene activity or gene repression. And note, for example, it's not just the modification, but partic the particular amino acid residue at where that modification occurs. So for example, certain lysines uh, can be methylated, and that can repress gene expression. Or methylation of other lysines can be associated with activation of genes. So for example, Methylation on histone 3 of lysines 9 and lysine 27 are classic modifications that lead to gene repression in eukaryotes. Whereas methylation of lysine 4, the fourth amino acid on the tail of histone 3, is a covalent modification that favors active expression of genes. And so I wanted to note how uh, we came to learn a bit about how this system works in Arabidopsis. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, looking at genetic, natural genetic variation led to some of the key genes that are involved in creating a vernalization requirement. And uh, genetic screens have also led to understanding how the exposure to cold leads to silencing of one of those key genes found from natural variation that I mentioned, the repressor, FLC. And there are two types of screens 
uh, that have been done by my lab and others. One is to take one of these lines that requires cold in order to flower, in other words, a vernalization requiring line, and mutagenize it, and then look through the mutants for plants that flower rapidly without cold. In other words, they behave as if they've been exposed to cold when they haven't. And this class of mutants reveals the type of genes whose proteins are responsible for helping Frigida turn on the FLC gene to create the vernalization requirement. And to summarize a lot of work by many groups, what we now know is that there are various general and specific activator complexes that are required for FLC to be expressed in the fall season to inhibit flowering. Some of those complexes are well known in many eukaryotic systems, a PAF complex, a SWER complex. These are critical for turning on genes. But there's also a complex that's unique to this fertilization system, a complex that includes that, uh, the protein encoded by that gene originally noted by workers decades ago as being critical for creating a vernalization requirement. So there's a complex with the Frigida gene and several other proteins specific to the vernalization system as well that turns on FLC. And this is associated with a certain chromatin structure of FLC. There are certain modifications to FLC chromatin that um, help create an active state in the fall. But an important question is, in biology, in general for gene activation, what determines the balance of activation and repression? In other words, if there's a battle going on, which there often is at a given gene between activators and repressors, what tips that balance in favor of activation or repression? And so to get at the other side, that first screen I talked about identified the activators of FLC. We also need to find the repressors in order to examine what tips that balance. And so a screen that, in a sense, is the opposite screen of the one I just described, a screen for vernalization in sensitive mutants, again, starts with a cold requiring line that requires vernalization to flower. We mutagenize, but instead of looking for plants that flower without vernalization, we find those plants where even if they have been vernalized, they no longer flower rapidly. In other words, we've now mutagenized key genes that are critical for the vernalization promotion of flowering. And I want to mention one of those genes, which turned out to be an important component of the system. And that's one we called vernalization insensitive 3. And one thing that was interesting about vernalization insensitive 3 is that the RNA level, it showed a very cold specific pattern of expression. So shown here in this uh, particular image is the red lines indicate, the first red line indicates our laboratory equivalent of fall. In other words, we grow plants under fairly warm conditions, but then we move them into a cold room. And that's our laboratory equivalent of winter, where they're in the cold for 10 days or 20 days, as indicated, or 40 days. And then we move them back out of the cold into warm growth conditions again. That's our laboratory equivalent of spring. And what you can see is that the VIN3 gene is only expressed at the RNA level when the plants have been in the cold for a while. And when they're moved back to warm, expression disappears. So this has a very cold or vernalization specific pattern of expression. Also shown here is what happens to FLC expression. That FLC is expression is diminished during the cold, but remains off when plants are moved back into warm conditions that mimic spring. And in fact, earlier I noted that in some plant species, there's a memory of winter. And this is a molecular illustration of that. Even when the, when the plants are removed from cold, that repression of FLC is maintained in the equivalent of spring. So what have we learned about how VIN3 works? Well, it turns out that, um, first of all, VIN3 is absolutely critical for this process. If we look at FLC expression, again, throughout our laboratory cold period, without VIN, an active VIN3 gene, repression doesn't occur. And what several labs 
uh, have shown is that VIN3 is actually part of a particular chromatin modifying complex. This complex is called the polycomb complex. It's present in a wide range of eukaryotic organisms from humans to plants. And what this complex does is it catalyzes one of those histone modifications that I mentioned, specifically methylation of lysine residue 27 in histone 3, which is one of the covalent modifications that favors repression of genes. And so, in that battle over activators and repressors, the addition of VIN3 to the polycomb complex enables it to win that battle, so to speak, of activators and repressors at the FLC locus and begin to add those repressive marks to FLC chromatin. Now, the polycomb complex in general regulates many genes in plants as well as animals. But the presence of the VIN3 protein creates a complex that we believe is specific to FLC. And this was critical in the evolution of a vernalization response. And I'll say a few more things about the evolution of these responses towards the end of this presentation. Another critical change that's occurring is a complex that's involved in adding methylation to the nine residue, lysine, number nine lysine residue of histone three. But there's another component to FLC uh, silencing as well that I wanted to mention. My lab showed some time ago that we, we could find a region in the middle of the intron of FLC that we called a vernalization responsive element. This region was actually necessary for FLC to be silenced during the process of vernalization. What's shown here is a diagram of the FLC gene where the thick blocks are exons that encode part of the protein, and the thinner lines are the introns, those regions of the gene that are spliced out during RNA processing. But in many eukaryotic genes, the intron regions of the DNA can contain regulatory regions. What we did was simply make deletions all through the FLC gene and ask what effect it would have. And when this region was deleted, here's what we found. Again, using that coding system I mentioned earlier, we start with plants grown in the warm, move them to cold for 40 days, and then back to warm, the equivalent of fall, winter, and spring. In the wild type, that you can see that FLC is shut off by cold and remains off, as I mentioned earlier. But when you remove this critical element, FLC is shut off to some extent in the cold. But then when the plants are moved to warm again, when spring arrives, so to speak, the repression is no longer stable. FLC comes back on. And so one of my colleagues who did this work while in my lab, C. Bum Sung, continued this um, in his lab at the University of Texas. And he showed that this element was actually a promoter for an RNA that originates in the intron of FLC. And this promoter creates what's called a long non-coding RNA. It doesn't code for protein, but a long RNA is produced in the cold from this element. Another lab, that of Caroline Dean, showed that another region of FLC being transcribed in the opposite direction also produces a different long non-coding RNA called cool air, whereas the one produced from the intron promoter is called cold air. The names, by the way, are related to one of the first um, long non-coding RNAs discovered in animals, which was called hot air. But what you can see is a very early event in the vernalization process is the in increased expression of these long non-coding RNAs. Shown here is a time course of exposure to cold from no cold up through 40 days of cold, and then moving the plants back into warm conditions for 10 days at the end of the experiment. What you can see in the black line is FLC expression uh, goes away during the process of vernalization, but some of the earliest events are the activation of, these, uh, of the transcription of these non-coding RNAs. And somehow this seems uh, critical for the process and the expression, the induction of the VIN3 gene comes later in the process. And so overall, what may be going on 
is illustrated in this slide. As I said earlier, in the fall, there are various complexes that are creating a chromatin state that favors an active expression at FLC. But then in the, win in the winter, there are some key components that are expressed. Uh, genes like VIN3, which make a protein as part of the polycomb. And the cold air non-coding RNA may actually be also a part of the polycomb complex, creating a complex, a variation of a complex, a different flavor of the complex, if you will, that's specific for targeting the chromatin of FLC itself. So what we have here, if I go back to a slide, is within FLC itself are the seeds of its own silencing in the expression of these non-coding, uh, long non-coding RNAs. And it seems like the first event in this process, and this is work from uh, several uh, labs, is probably the activity of the polycomb complex at the FLC locus. So this starts at the beginning of winter, and this does what I would describe as changing the histone code. It's increasing the density of this repressive modification. As the system proceeds uh, into spring, it's also critical that lysine 9 methylation be added to FLC as well to create stable silencing. Because in the spring, when it's warm again, if you remember from the data I showed earlier, some of these critical components to initiate the silencing process, like the VIN3 protein or the long non-coding RNAs, are no longer present. So the system now is in a new stable state that can maintain repression in the absence of some of these key initiators of the process. I'll just show you one bit of data that uh, indicates the nece necessity of things like the lysine 9-methylation complex for maintenance of silencing of FLC. If one of its components, such as a, a gene called HP1 for like heterochromatin protein 1, a plant equivalent of a known uh, component of chromatin modification in animals called heterochromatin protein 1 is missing, FLC does begin to be silenced in the cold. But as we move it back to the warm, it comes on again. In other words, this is a loss of memory mutant. So we can see then that certain components are involved in initiation and others are involved in the long-term memory of this silencing process. But I don't want to give you the impression that all plants that undergo vernalization have a memory. A rel here's a relative of Arabidopsis called Arabes alpina. This particular species doesn't, it needs cold to flower, but it doesn't have a memory of that cold. And that's actually critical for its life history. This plant is a perennial. A perennial is a plant that goes through many cycles of flowering year after year. Whereas Arabidopsis is an annual that flowers and then produces seed and dies. For a perennial to be able to live year after year, it needs to be able to save some of its meristems to continue to produce leaves and stems for the next season. It, it would be um, impossible to commit all the meristems to flowering and still be a perennial. So this particular plant species has a system very similar to Arabidopsis. That is, its flowering is repressed because of expression of FLC, but when cold suppresses FLC, some of the meristems become flowering, but those that don't, don't have a memory. So they go back to a vegetative situation, producing just leaves and stems for next year's growth. So I want to summarize um, what I've told you about the process of vernalization. It involves measuring cold, and when a sufficient length of cold is measured, things like VIN3 and non-coding RNAs are induced, this leads to a switch of FLC, which I would call epigenetic, because at least in Arabidopsis, there is this memory that survives DNA replication and mitotic cell divisions, which leads to competence to flower, and in the next generation, FLC is reset. And through genetic analyses, we in many labs have learned a lot about what's occurring in the middle of the process, what happens once cold is measured, and what enables flowering to occur. But what we don't know much at all about is how plants are actually measuring this long period of cold or how this gene, FLC, is reset from generation to generation, where it's, where it's stably repressed during mitotic cell division. But when the 
cells that undergo meiosis to make the next generation proceed through meiosis and into the next generation, that repression needs to be reset back to the active state. So these are things that will be the future studies will hopefully reveal. But I wanted to end with a couple uh, thoughts on the evolution of vernalization requirements. In another iBio talk, I talked about the photoperiod system. And that's actually a very ancient system by which plants respond to changes in day length. And as I mentioned in that talk, it controls not only flowering, but many other processes like dormancy as well. Whereas vernalization is very specific to flowering. And in the next slide, this is an image of what our planet looked like a mere 150 million years or so ago. Considering that the Earth is 4.5 billion years old, this is fairly recent. But one thing you might note from this image, and I've chosen this because this is the time around which flowering plants were diversifying, that the Earth was a quite different place. For example, you don't find much by way of an Atlantic Ocean, but more importantly, the climate was warmer, and uh, you don't see, for example, polar ice caps. In other words, flowering plants had begun to diversify before there was a need to adapt to winters. Therefore, as climate changed on our planet and continents drifted, those plants that were able to thrive in temperate climates that had winter independently evolved systems to cope with that, whether they're vernalization systems or systems to allow dormancy over the winter period. But one thing that's interesting, so far in the plants where vernalization systems are beginning to be understood, they all have a similar circuitry. As I mentioned, there are inductive photoperiods that lead to the production of fluorogen, which then in the meristem turn on a range of genes. And here's just a few uh, of, of the types of genes in different species that are turned on in the meristem to cause the initiation of flowers. So this circuitry, as I mentioned, of photoperiod flowering is conserved. It's ancient. And what's overlaid on that, and what I've illustrated to you in the discussion of Arabidopsis, is that all it takes to create a vernalization system is to add a repressor to this system so that this activating system can't cause flowering, and to have cold somehow uh, remove the repression of flowering. And that's what I've just described to you in Arabidopsis which is a member of the cabbage family. But there are other systems where various labs have made incredible progress in understanding fertilization systems in other species. For example, uh, there's been recent work in beet that shows that um, a protein that's actually a homolog of fluorogen itself, but one that has flower uh, inhibiting activity, is the repressor. I've already described to you in Arabidopsis that it's a Madsbox type of gene called flowering locus C, which is the repressor in this group of plants. In grasses that include crops like wheat or barley, it turns out to be a protein of a different nature that carries a domain of a protein called a zinc finger that binds to DNA. So we can see that there's a similar circuitry of how plants adapted to cold, but it's clearly convergent evolution, meaning it occurred independently but at least in this outline form, there are some subtle differences. But overall, the circuitry of how these vernalization systems evolved is similar in the three types of plants where progress has been made in understanding those systems. I wanted to end uh, by thanking the National Science Foundation, the USDA, and the National Institutes of Health, which over the years have funded our work on understanding flowering at a molecular level.